Hello, gurus from around the world. My name is Shruti and I'm 14 years old and I live in Pune, India. Welcome to our Ubud Zoom session where me and my co-host Maya, who is 14 years old and lives in Tunis, Tunisia, will be interviewing our guest change maker, Dr. Andana Kapoor, who is from India and lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts, USA. Dr. Andhra Kapoor is a co-founder of Mad India, a film and digital storytelling collective. She leads projects on social innovation, media literacy, and gender inclusion. Her work as a documentary maker is critically acclaimed and has been showcased at over 70 film festivals globally. She is currently attending she is currently attending the Howard Kennedy School of Government pursuing a mid-career MBA. Andana's work links to several sustainable development goals, especially Goal 5, Gender Equality. Maya and I will ask, for, ask questions to Andana about her background, her journey, her work, her skills and her impact. We hope that you will enjoy the session and I will now start with our first question to the guest speaker. Can you please tell us a little bit about you and what you do for work? I just wanted to start by saying thank you so much, both of you, for talking to me today. It's always exciting to talk to um, not just young people, but especially young women, because I think the future lies with us and with you guys. So well <laughs> done on what you're doing and more power to you. And uh, yeah, so um, so I would like to sort of start by saying that, you know, uh, filmmaking is, is something that uh, did not come to me naturally. It's, it's a path that I found by pushing my boundaries. And uh, I'm somebody who gave up engineering to take up literature first uh, because I thought that, you know, words were something that I was comfortable with and I wanted to express myself. And uh, even though I love math, uh, I was in an education system which made you pre-decide where you would go. So you either did only the humanities or you only did the sciences. There was no blending of the both. And I think through my life, I'm trying to sort of bring contraries together. Uh, and then uh, when I finished uh, with literature, I said, you know, words are not enough. What can I add to it? And then images obviously became an answer. And while I was in film school, I started realizing that, you know, the everyday is charged with so many opportunities. Uh, the stories of people who are around us are so exciting and important. We just have to listen and develop the skill of presenting them in a way that we can acknowledge them and celebrate them and use them for the kind of impact that we want. And that is why storytelling and filmmaking and particularly the documentary genre became something that I started doing more and more of. And of course, I can write and produce uh, and direct across mediums, whether it's animation or whether it is live action or whether it is uh, a TV show. Uh, but at the end of the day, my whole idea is to look at the everyday and the magic in it. Uh, and I don't say that with just stars in my eyes, because really I've seen how small conversations can completely change points of view of very powerful people as well. So it's about, you know, celebrating that and keeping a record of that memory of those people and of those choices. Yeah. Okay, uh, so we wanted to ask you first, before knowing, uh, getting to know what you do now, we wanted to know what was your childhood like? Uh, what did you do in your childhood? What kind of games you liked? Uh, what you wanted to do and stuff like that about your childhood? Okay, so I'm uh, infamous for being a very naughty child. Uh, <laughs> not because I ever played any pranks on anybody, but because I just wanted to run free. So a large part of my childhood is just me running. So I used to uh, sprint. I used to just, I love, even today, I just love the wind in my hair and just sort of running out and uh, you know going beyond Be free. yes totally totally and going beyond what what people say is your limit right so if somebody says don't go here then I have to go there <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to be to be very fair uh, I mean that is just a sliver of who I was I think I owe a lot to both my parents uh, my father was in a transferable job he was a doctor with the Indian Air Force so we traveled uh, through various oh, parts wow. of the country yeah. And, and, and I stayed in like very small remote areas and big cities and it gave me the opportunity to accept people for who they are. Right. And a lot of stereotypes, they make no sense to me because even though they're an interesting or an obvious way for somebody to encounter a place for the first time, it's not enough. You have to give people the opportunity and see and, and appreciate how they live and what they do. And uh, 
My mother is an educationist. She's a professor uh, of English language teaching. And we traveled uh, to every place that we did, collecting the stories of the people, reading local literature, thanks to her. Uh, and uh, I have a younger brother and uh, we were raised equally. Uh, my parents did not discriminate in terms of opportunities. And I think that was very important because there is a lot of implicit discrimination against uh, the girl child. And it comes in various ways. Like people would give him different gifts and give me different gifts. So my father would refuse both sets of gifts and say, no, you, you know, you don't have to gift either child anything. Uh, but if you're giving something, even if it's a toffee, they will divide it equally. Yeah, the same. Yeah. 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 So I grew up with these principles of, of, you know, discovering for myself or fighting for myself uh, if there was any injustice and for celebrating people, you know, being grateful. Because sometimes we would live in places where you could not buy anything. You would eat the same food for many days because, uh, you know, vegetables could not reach you. But you appreciated it. And uh, I think that part of my childhood I'll be grateful for. I also grew up in a country which at that time uh, had opportunity for uh, and tolerance for each other. Uh, so I sometimes feel like my childhood was a better time. Because there was, it was so easy for me to celebrate different festivals, go from one home to another. Uh, it did not matter what your religion was, um, and and getting a lot to know of, tra traditions about different places and getting yeah. to know different people, learning about their correct, correct. Those opportunities I think were great because of the way my childhood was structured. And till date, I'm so glad that uh, you know a, an intercultural approach to life is is easier for me than it is for other people and I'm so deeply grateful for that yeah great thank you for this answer yeah great answer so uh, my next question was I saw one of your documents like I didn't see it I read about it mm -hmm. the great Indian Jugaar mm -hmm. yeah so can you tell me about it I'm really interested in it oh certainly certainly so Jugaar I think is a term which is used in India and South Asia, at most, it basically means a quick fix, okay? But it's also an attitude. Uh, so it basically means that, you know, I'll find a jugar. That is, I will find some solution, even though it's not necessarily the right solution in terms of the rules. Maybe it's not the obvious solution, but you find a quick fix and you make things happen, right? So um, when I started working on this film, actually, I had a friend, his name is Avishek. Uh, he was working on a an application to a business school at that time. And he and I got talking about how Jugaad is what defines businesses in India. And Jugaad is not a bad word. It's not necessarily corruption. It's being inventive and innovative. And that's when the idea of trying to make something visual around it started. And then, you know, I, it was my first independent film. I put in my savings. I worked with like my teammates. I had a, a classmate named Dhrubo who uh, worked on the camera and then I had uh, you know other people working with me like uh, classmates like Anshuman, I had a dear friend Sodamini. So I'm just naming these people because they are the ones who sort of came together and worked with me and uh, my my dearest friend and colleague Subhash, uh, that's you know one of the first projects that we worked on together. Uh, he was my editor. All of these people came together because everybody was so excited about the idea of Jugaad because everybody had a different definition of it. So what I did literally was to take to the streets and highways of India and ask people, what do they think about this word? And it was so revelatory because everybody had an opinion. Everybody had a different opinion. And it was as if, you know, the country had come out to like debate and talk about what this word means. Should we be ashamed of it? You know, are we like corrupt? Should we be proud of it because we survive no matter what? And why is it called Jugaar? And should you call it innovation? Or should you let it remain Jugaad? And what is the politics of that? Because for those who are doing scientific work, they want to say we are innovative. But those who are surviving, they want to say we've done Jugaad. And where do the two meet? That becomes an interesting question. Uh, for, you know, me, even now, our long years after the film has uh, been screened and presented. So, and I got 17 rejections from film festivals when I sent it. And I was convinced that, you know, I, I, I'm not cut out for this career. I've made the wrong decisions and I'm going to let everybody down. And then I uh, sort of received uh, an email saying that, you know, I'm considered for a festival in Germany. And I said, okay, you know, let it go. It'll be fine. And uh, so the day 
that the festival was happening in germany obviously because of the time difference in india you know it was already the next day for us and on a lark just on a lark i typed into google anandana kapoor wins and it auto completed and and i was like oh my god we won and you know like so so that moment i cannot even sort of tell you it was just a lark i was just sitting on my computer and i said ah, i'll just type anandana kapoor wins and it auto completed and there was no looking back after that in the sense that it traveled to other places it's it's taught it's been uh, referred to in articles and conversations so it was a slow slow build up uh but uh, so so the point is that the first project taught me so much about friendships about people uh about persistence about failure and then success uh and not giving up you know that that lesson so doing jugar no matter what <laughs> okay so the next question we wanted to ask you so what are your interests um i mean out of your professional life and your I mean as yeah what are your interests out of so i uh do like reading um and i like to dance uh i'm also um i think i have abandoned philately <laughs> and numismatism so i have like tons of stamps and coins uh which i used to diligently collect uh, when i was younger but i have a lot of them uh and uh more than anything else i think i enjoy walking and and trying to um relax yeah and observe nature to see see things that we miss uh in that and uh, sometimes i like to sort of recreate it through art which is which is not my main main work uh the whole idea is to slow down and to be able to you know be myself in a way that i'm not shifting making decisions uh just allowing things to happen to me you know so those kinds of activities are are what i that i really enjoy and a lot of my instagram uh, you know posts have the hashtag walk with me pause with me uh so the anything that i'm pursuing outside of filmmaking or uh the community work that i do or teaching you know lies within that walking and pausing yeah walking and pausing <laughs> that's Amazing. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But choose where you're pausing. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, in one of the articles I read, you wrote with. I think you were the co-writer of the article. Yeah. You wrote about um, how a business can have a sustainable approach. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, can you tell me about it? Yeah. So um I think the article you're referring to has to do with a co-written piece with Priya and Aparna. Yes. Uh, we're looking at the artisan economy and artisans yes. uh, in India are not just people who make handicraft but they're also uh you know tellers of stories. They perform songs so they have a lot of uh, intergenerational knowledge and they have sustainable methods of producing things. So for example uh if you were to look at any artist who makes say pattachitra scrolls so what a pattachitra pattachitra is a style of scroll painting from a place called bengal west bengal in india what the artists do is that they paint stories so these stories could depict i have seen it I've you seen have it. you have yeah, oh, nice. yeah. 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 and they they are very beautiful they are they made with hand they are done on a uh, scroll paper and some of them depict stories like weddings of animals or uh stories which have a uh, contemporary commentary so it's report the artist wants to express and uh you know they, they will probably take black rice to make the black color they will uh you know squeeze uh, flowers to get uh pinks they will uh, look at certain vegetable juices to make green so it's sustainable and the whole world which is developed and westernized is now talking about sustainability whereas these practices have existed over time So when we talk about sustainability in that context what we're trying to say is that we have to recognize these artisans as entrepreneurs we need to give them what they need rather than saying that they need to change for us they don't need to wear business suits they don't need to come to board rooms we need to go to them see what they need and provide it to them and sustainability is not just about uh did i use a green method sustainability is what is happening across generations Uh, are people able to uh, prosper what is their definition of prosperity maybe it's not five air conditioners maybe their definition of prosperity is being able to make more art 
live where they are have access to education so for me sustainability becomes more than just a you know like a watermark or a certification it becomes a deeper process of asking what people want across generations so for example ubud to me is a sustainability measure as well because you are listening to my story and somewhere we are archiving these stories and then somebody else can inherit some wisdom maybe or some lesson about what to do or what not to do uh, from this right to me that is also sustainability how do you sustain across generations how do you use methods which are low cost low carbon uh, more productive and how do you provide systems that these continue they don't die uh, to, so you know that is the context in which we were writing about this and uh, why this is important is because it's challenging how we look at um, businesses usually businesses usually are for individual profit we're looking at community profit but we are looking at profit and we're looking at reinvestment in local causes not necessarily in private banks Oh, that's another way to look at it. <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to ask you: Is there someone that inspires you in some way, and like someone you think is your power? Of, I mean, motivation and everything. Um, so, um, you know, uh, I've never had a, a fan girl moment in one sense, uh, but I find that there are several people who can be my role models. in my everyday life um uh, whether it is um you know women filmmakers who have had to sort of come out and uh not just fight a male dominated industry for space for legitimacy for equal wages but also for trying to tell the stories that they want to tell like so there's great leadership mm-hmm. in that uh, any filmmaker uh who is who is a woman who is um you know uh non cis and is trying to represent their individuality to me is inspiring because it takes courage to do that uh i also find that uh you know like my role models are also say my parents who find it very easy to uh, say the truth and and bear the costs uh who will think of somebody else before they think of themselves uh and still lead lives where they have provided and and made life comfortable for us and and uh continue to do what they want to do it's so inspiring uh and uh, i also want to mention a friend of mine she's um, visually impaired her name is anjali she's uh, india's first uh, visually impaired uh, supreme court lawyer woman uh and uh i have seen her navigate the difficulties in life with the best kind of attitude whenever i meet her the first thing she does is to check if i'm doing well uh even though she's visually impaired when we walk together i may trip she will not this is a person who has me right and and who uh is not uh, romanticizing anything about her struggles her anger her frustrations uh, but is somebody who uh continues to strive true real yeah and she continues to strive uh in ways which are so private so real and so beautiful so i think i i i always go back to how amazing she is yeah yeah that's great really wow. Thank you. Yeah. So my question. We all wish we had a friend like this. <laughs> oh well. Oh uh, yeah. Happy to introduce you to her. <laughs> yeah. 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 So my question is, um, in your daily job, what's the most toughest thing you've gone through? Like mm-hmm. when you felt that you cannot do this anymore. Hmm. Ah, so that's such an interesting question. I think. Because I think everything has that one time when you're like, I'm done. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, there are okay. So I have I, I'll nuance this. You know, I've I've worked um, in a in a television network, and I've done my own work, and I've taught in the university, and I continue to do projects. So so my portfolio is kind of wide ranging, mm-hmm. uh, and but the common thread I think uh, one sometimes becomes fatigue because in the creative industry we. have poor compensation and recognition for hours that are spent in fine tuning something right uh for art to really make an impact there is that fine chiseling that you need to do uh, that extra you know thread that you need to be able to touch and those i think are moments where 
both both the person who is the creative as well as the person who is the client can can lose sight of where to stop right so one is that that how do you moderate your hours the point at which to give up a project in what is largely an unregulated industry so fatigue becomes a component i i i will not uh make the mistake of saying that an artist life is not difficult because you really have to push yourself but the points at which i have felt particularly challenged not to the point of giving up but maybe to a point of despair sometimes is when i have encountered sexism or sexual harassment i think yeah. at those points it has been difficult because uh you you at that point in time feel very alone even though you may have allies and people who you can turn to for help but you feel very alone and it's something that you do not necessarily uh, have any uh, rational logic for it's not something you did right it's it's in the approach and the attitude of the other person so i i i do recognize a time when uh, you know i w- i was in charge of a very large set and there were barely one or two women and uh, there was some comments that were made which really unsettled me but i remember like i stood my ground and i refused to proceed with the filming till uh, you know the person who made those comments had been removed from the production but it took a lot of effort you know uh, and and for me i think that part uh, really does sort of destabilize me uh, uh now not as much because i've i've learned i can anticipate it and at least now that i have my own independent practice none of this is allowed or accepted uh i have uh you know uh, jay and subhash who are co-founders with me uh they uh, and i are uh, very particular that you know our setup is inclusive it's welcoming uh you can argue you can get angry but you cannot get unfair you know mm-hmm. so so that i think is is the important part and and uh, so inclusion and trying to make it an equal and safe space uh, is something that i have then tried to provide for myself and for people who work with me as an answer to all of you know this kind of encounter that i might have had and you know it's also it's also in the places you live in in india for example women still do not have access to washrooms right mm-hmm. in villages in cities so if i'm menstruating if i need to use the washroom there is nowhere that i can go so that violence to my body right which i will uh, allow because you know i have to continue to work is not something that the men undergo and that i think is another point of frustration it really changes how you are so i think gender dynamics sexism uh sexual violence those are things which which exist uh and uh, it's best not to deny them it's best to recognize them and try and work around them and those are the points at which i felt particularly stretched uh more so than trying to find boundaries in an unstructured in- industry yeah uh, yeah so yeah the women have to fight every day to get rights that or i mean women and girls like us we need to fight every day to be able to have some rights that the the boys and men and everyone i mean Don't yeah understand like have and yeah it's really hard and i think even in school sometimes there are sexist comments that are made and i mean yeah. yeah i understand the things that you say because um it's really hard to uh pass this uh the the comments can, boys can make and and stuff like that like go go to the kitchen and stuff like that it's not even funny and it's not even it's yeah it's hard and uh, i didn't know about the the raw washroom uh, thing in india but I, i mean even in my country even now in us in usa there's an uh, abortion uh, law that's is trying yeah to, i find this very unfair and why would men try to um to decide on what women do with their own bodies i mean it's their life yeah exactly so and my question is there's so many myths about oh, yeah. the menstruating yes the men. there's so many myths yeah that's that's the actually the first film that for a feature length film that i had made it's called blood on my hands mm-hmm. it's on mm-hmm. menstrual taboos and it's about how uh women are controlled because of menstruation and in the film too uh there is a speaker who highlights a fact uh, that you know uh, maya you were speaking of in shridi that you are referencing right now which is that 
why do men control women's bodies because women's bodies are uh, fertile their bodies ensure the next generation and it's about controlling power and in the past women and property were equated together and so you wanted to control the woman so that you could control not just your bloodline but also who would inherit the property and that's why yeah. we focus on you know the male child and uh, over time you know it has devolved into these myths of what men and women can or cannot do right and of course some of it is is biology but a lot of it is is um, culture so when women are not or the girl child is not given enough food or equal food as the son when she starts uh, puberty and she becomes anemic or weaker that weakness builds up over time and it impacts her ability to sometimes perform sometimes be counted as an equal but it starts so much earlier right it starts mm-hmm. with maybe a malnourished mother maybe a mother in law who gives more food to her son in law and not to the daughter in law or women who are told you must look very thin during pregnancy you have to be very fit you can't eat this you can't do that you need to be feminine you need to cross your legs you need to do stuff like that like, like details that count you know absolutely the and details that don't even matter correct which is why i feel that you know like today it's the three of us talking we completely understand each other right we also needed a man in the room yeah i feel that more than daughters we need to talk to sons more than sisters yeah, exactly yeah exactly tell them to the boys so that they know yes. what's happening and they can act when they grow because we are a new generation so if we need to change we need to tell them also because if we keep it with ourselves yes how will they get to know Absolutely. Yeah, and I think before telling girls to put longer sleeves or to put longer, longer jeans or longer shorts or stuff like that, try and educate your sons first before saying you're going to because I mean in some schools in my school they say that um um we are I mean we need to put longer like uh, clothes where, 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 because yeah. yeah because we're going to we're going to distract boys. How yeah, I, you know, in our school they said that so we had a meeting and they called only girls hmm. and they said something about food eating habits and now they said the boys can go to play we have to come so we didn't know what it was about so we were like why are they calling us even we want to play so then we went and they were, and we were talking about how 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 the society wants us to look thin um how there's a as a how there's a perfect type then only you're perfect your thin your hair long your hair perfect like that so exactly. um, you know, one of the girls stood up and said that we need to bring in the boys and tell them to tell them this because yes. we know this ourselves yes yes i think that's why i think uh it's too bad i'm also turning to the idea of women uh, again solving the problem but i think how mothers talk to their sons becomes so important uh, yeah you really. know and 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 i know that sometimes women are in situations where they are completely trapped and they cannot enact the kind of freedom or choices but you know you can certainly um tell your children or your sons about what's possible even if they they are not choices you were able to enact right so mm-hmm. uh, i think it's so important and it's important to involve the boys to make them understand that uh because they are also victims of patriarchy boys don't cry boys have to you know always have bravado exactly. uh, they cannot take other kinds of professions which are not mainstream they, they do not dance they cannot uh do gymnastics they cannot be feminine they cannot do certain acts or they should talk be manly way, or uh, talk they shouldn't cry in public yeah. so so yeah, that means, exactly that means regulation is both sides we need to we need to therefore find ground where we can talk and address this together which is yes. why again like i said that you know now it's three of us maybe next time when we talk it, we need to invite at least two more individuals yeah, boys and who are not cisgender women right who are from uh, other um, identities yeah cultural yes. different cultures cultural, gender based whatever right so that we can nuance what we're talking of and and really look at how to change things because it's not about overthrowing this invisible enemy no it's about saying that again sustaining it talking about we have the fire how do we you know take the fire to the right place so that there is warmth not destruction exactly yes
Yeah, woman power. <laughs> <That was funny. laughs> yeah. uh, I just wanted to ask, so I know, you know you are at Harvard now, mm-hmm. Harry Kennedy School, and I wanted to know what you think got you to Harvard, got you to uh, enter in Harvard, like what's the thing that, that I mean, uh, Harvard University said, we need to accept this, I mean, we need to um, to have her in her school, you know. Oh, now that's a tough one. I, 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 I do not know how the admission committee <laughs> makes its final decisions. I don't know how I have ended up here. It's thanks to the encouragement of my brother and my partner, uh, both of whom, uh, you know, believed that whatever work I was doing uh, deserved a bigger platform. In fact, my brother has been my biggest champion in coming here. His name is Dinesh. Uh, and he essentially felt that uh, the work that I'm doing uh, can find more resonance and uh, can find more allies uh, on a stage which is uh, as, um, I would say, large scale, as uh, beautiful and as compelling as the Harvard stage. And, you know, for example, meeting Rim and then getting to talk to you. And, and for us to think of things that, you know, we can do together or, or talk of things that inspire us. That's exactly what I needed to do. Uh, and I know that uh, my place at Harvard is among people who have taken chances, who have seen failure, but have somehow or the other, whether it is because of the people around them, because of personal courage or just the instinct to survive, have overcome whatever obstacle that they faced. And uh, are dreaming for other people as well, not just for themselves. You know, there is always a we in it. There is always a us in it. And and I uh, sort of firmly believe in that sentiment also, uh, which is why my PhD is on co-creation. I'm constantly looking at ways with which to collaborate with people. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, and you learn and grow or you learn uh, what not to do. But I think that that idea of the we and trying to imagine for more than just one person is what is common to all of us who are in the program, the program that I am part of. Uh, and I think perhaps when they are curating who can be in the next batch, that is something that is being encouraged as well. It, it's not just about yourself. Really nice. Thank you for this answer. Yes, and also I have a last question. Uh, what would you say to uh, children who, I mean, not children, but yeah, exactly. What would you tell them to, uh, I mean, what would be your advice for us? Like your principles or what we should follow? Yeah. One is um, look at people around you whose integrity you admire, right? Not necessarily their wealth, not necessarily their accolades, but their integrity. See what choices they have made to maintain that integrity. And remember that that is the only thing that will make a difference between you having a good night's rest and being ready for battle the next day and you uh, being tired and cynical. Because life will have a lot of challenges. You have to choose your metrics, right? And, And there is no morality per se. It's just choices that you make. So choose the people whose choices you respect and try and you know build up on that. The second thing is talk to people who you completely disagree with. Because that is the only way you will be able to find a way to solve things. And this is you know something I'm trying to imbibe in my life as well. Which is talking to people whose politics I don't agree with. Traveling to places whose politics completely, completely is antithetical to mine. Breaking bread with people whose, uh, you know, conversations make me feel worried about the future. But coming back and thinking a lot about these people exist. How do I connect with them? What can I do that eventually we will find something that we can work on together? Work towards the humanity and not just in the individuality. That is something if you can strive for. Humanity above individuality very tough it's so tough because you know we spend our lives trying to be different and and top of the cream but how do you find commonality that means you have to step back you have to let the other person come forward 
and you really have to talk to people who disagree with you if you can do that these two things i think uh what you think advice i wouldn't i didn't think about it This thank you doctor and i for thank um, you so much for your answers and yeah i'd love to be in touch and uh, please uh, always remember that uh, there is nothing that can hold you back uh, and no matter how dark it looks uh, there is sunlight around the corner just believe that so this was an amazing conversation thank you anand and maya for the great discussion and for all the things we learned today thank you viewers for listening to this interview make sure to follow us on instagram and twitter and subscribe to our youtube channel so you can hear about our upcoming session with our change makers thank you thank you maya thank you shiti